Hi, welcome to the noise path. In this episode, we'll take a look at a mailbag item that I have, which I thought might be helpful in the lab for future videos that we will be making. Now, surely you've seen these vertical scanners in some form in the past. This is a Caesar E24 Pro model, and it does have a 16 to 25 megapixel camera here at the top that looks down on the surface. Now, a lot of the magic of these instruments is in the software because they can detect where the object is, they can do character recognition, they can even flatten the page if the page is wavy, like if it's in a book, and is intended to do a lot of fast scans. But one thing this instrument here does have that I really like is it does have a live HDMI output for live presenting of whatever that's placed here. Now we do that a lot here and sometimes I want to take a note or look over a schematic and I was wondering how well this would work in a live preview being captured directly from the HDMI port. And then we'll take a look at some of these other features and some of the unique things they can do especially with the software. Now when it comes to vertical scanners like that illumination is really important to get a good image quality. Now this particular unit offers two different types of illumination. There's a light at the very top of the unit of course with two levels of intensity. Now this light is nice because it's co-located with the aperture of the camera which means that when you look down on a subject there will be no shadows at all which is quite nice in many situations. But if the page you're looking at say is glossy then you get a direct glare up back onto the camera. So if you want to avoid that you're going to have to have a light that comes from a different angle. And actually they do have this thing that attaches in the back magnetically which is a nice design in itself. It's got multiple lights over here that cast a white beam but at an angle coming onto the page. It only has two pins actually for power, which is interesting. And it has a touch sensitive control in the back. So it snaps into the back of the unit, like so. And once it's in there, it just stays in and you can turn it on and off with just touching it in the back. And that removes glare quite a bit in many, many scenarios. Sometimes I even have both of them on at the same time, which is not a problem. So let's see how that looks using an example. So here's the live output from the camera, 1080p, 60 frames per second. And the camera does some processing on the contrast and the way it deals with colors before it sends it out through the HDMI port. This is undoubtedly so that features of text can come out even more. So here's a white piece of paper. If I put my hand on it, you can clearly see the boundaries of where my fingers are being really enhanced and those contrasting regions really stand out. We can try the light situation as well. So here's a very difficult example. This is the Open Circuits book, highly recommended. Now the surface of this is almost like a mirror. And these two glares that you see are from the lights exactly at the very top. We can turn those lights off and we can turn the side light on. And look at that, it's completely gone. It's quite nice from that point of view, it really does solve that problem. So they have thought about this. If I, I can of course turn both of them on again, but then you'll get the, the glares back. So if I turn the top lights off and I tilt this, you can eventually see those four lights. But of course, you would never scan anything in this situation. You will always have it flat. Definitely take a look at this book, but I'm quite happy about the way this lighting is working. So let's go through a really quick analysis of an analog circuit here on this page so we can get an idea of how this camera would work in our future videos. And then you can tell me if you like the format and you think this is doing a good job in terms of capturing what I'm writing. So let's try and solve an, an amplifier. I'm just going to pick one top of my head. Let's take a cascode amplifier, but let's make it interesting and make our cascode amplifier be made of a hybrid of devices, bipolars and MOSFETs. So we're going to use this example circuit here, okay? So we have a, an NPN transistor as our input transistor, the signal input comes over here, we have a cascode NMOS transistor, and then we have an active load PMOS transistor. We're going to take the output from here. So we want to find a gain of this circuit, we want to find out what Vout over Vn is, okay? And we're going to approximate this for first order and see what happens. And the result of it is actually a little bit surprising. Let's see what happens. So the gain is obviously going to depend on the transconductance of the input transistor. So we're going to write that out, that transconductance minus GM1, the gain of this amplifier is negative, and then it's going to be multiplied by the total resistance seen at the output. And the total resistance seen at the output is going to have two terms, resistance at the top and the resistance at the bottom. So I'm going to write that out. I'm not going to explain why that is right now. But the resistance at the bottom is R01 plus R02 plus the GM effective of the transistor 2 times R01 times R02. And then that's going to be in parallel with the resistance at the top. Okay, so if you look at this entire equation, you can quickly see that because of the parallel terms here, this entire part doesn't matter at all because R01 is so much larger than R03 because it's a bipolar transistor, at least for the type of uh, transistors that we're looking at. Let's say that this process is less than 65 nanometer for the CMOS nodes, okay, just for the sake of accuracy. So we can rewrite this and simplify it out a little bit, so we, get, we end up with minus GM1 times RO3, and we can rewrite that a little bit more. We can write the minus GM as its in, uh, actual equation, which is IC over VT, 
Okay, so we have minus IC over a VT, and the RO3 is the early voltage of the transistor divided by ID. Now take a look at this. This is interesting because ID and IC are actually the same because the same current flows through the entire transistor, which means this term and this term cancels out. So we end up with minus VA over VT. Now VT itself, let's say at room temperature, is about 25, 26 millivolt. So this ends up being minus 38 times VA. And look at that. This has absolutely no relationship with the power consumption of the circuit at all. It's only a function of the early voltage. And the early voltage is a device parameter, which is a function of the length of the transistor as well as the process it's implemented in. So in this example, it doesn't matter how much current you put in. The size of the transistors for most parts do not matter at all. For the low frequency gain of this circuit, the gain will always be this value at the first order approximation. There it is. So this is the kind of analysis I'm talking about. As you can see, I can write all this out. The contrast is really good. It does have a high frame rate and it's correlated with, of course, me speaking. So let me know what you think about this. So what about looking at things like circuit boards under this? Well, it's not really intended for that. It works and you can kind of see what's going on, but it's, you can't really see the nice details that you would want to from things that have really fine features and have really complex structures like this one. It does have a zoom function. You can see that the zoom is shown over there. And yeah, you can zoom in, but yeah, it doesn't resolve things as, as much as I would like. So for example, it's hard to see the details or the part numbers of the parts. It's, it's not intended for that. We're going to try scanning these anyway, because I think the HDMI output does not have the same quality as when you scan it, because it can take more time to capture an image. So we'll take a look. But for live review, I'm going to stick with text. And here's the main Caesar scanner software. Now this software can only be used with their own hardware. You need to have a serial number of the hardware piece you're actually using to be able to take advantage of it, which I kind of understand because a lot of the differentiating feature of the scanner are actually built into the software itself. The software is also kept up fairly regularly. I have gone through several iterations of the version too, so that's good to know that they're constantly updating and you can ask for requests of, of changes and, and features and so on. Now it does have its own built-in visualizer and it's working through the USB port and the quality is better than the HDMI but of course the frame rate is quite a bit lower so you can also zoom in as you can see and you can also annotate this directly here if you want to annotate something as you're working on it and you can capture a video on this as well and you can store the video you can see there's a record button down here of course that's not what I'm doing because I'm capturing the entire app but it's nice to know that there is some screen capture features built into it as well let's go ahead and raise that now the unit also comes with two other pieces there's a foot pedal, like so, that you can use uh, under the table, and there's also a little clicker that you can use to take pictures. It's clearly intended so that if you're flipping through books and pages and you're scanning very quickly, you don't have to ha need both of your hands to do this. These connect to the back of the unit directly, not to the computer, and essentially it all becomes a nice single integrated unit. All right, let's try to do some scanning over here. So let's enable the scan function. I'm going to drop a page over here on just some random orientation. And as you can see, it does pick up the corners quite nicely. That's one of the advantages of having this cover shift with the unit because it gives you such a high contrast as this is very non-reflective. So let's go and capture this. So I have it on a flat single page here at the highest resolution this thing can do. And this is a black and white. So we're going to scan that. Press that and see what happens. There it is. I fixed it also, which is quite good. There it is. Looks actually quite nice. So let's capture a couple of more because I want to then compare them all together. And here's our color example. Now, obviously not using the top light anymore for this. And it captured that as well. So now we have three unique examples. And they all look nice. Now I want to convert them to PDF, but I want to convert them to a searchable PDF and see how well it can actually analyze the text that's on there. There's a lot of different combination of text in there, especially in a data sheet. You have stuff in graphs, stuff outside of the graphs, different fonts, and so on. Let's see how much of this it can actually capture. So we can select all three of these files. And then we're going to do a searchable PDF export. And here you can choose your language. I have set the PDF quality to high. And this is going to be English, of course. And we're going to leave everything to automatic. This is, we just want to be easy to use. Let's see what it comes up with. So it's going to now internally do everything itself. And you can just leave this. It will run in the background. But it's reasonably fast. Remember, it's intended to do potentially hundreds of pages at a time. So you can put a set of batch tasks in there in the background. And you can do even a whole bunch of corrections to the stuff you've already scanned in a batch format, which is very useful for large tasks. So I have here both the images open as well as the converted PDF. So the images look you know, reasonably good. Again, this is a compromise between the speed in which you can scan something and the ultimate quality of capturing something. This is 350 dpi. Of course, in a regular scanner that scans linearly, you can get much, much higher resolution, but it will also take a lot longer. And here's the other page. 
and here's the image of the book itself again there's no glare on it it looks reasonably good the photograph that's on the cover of the book itself has roughly the same kind of features and uh, some of these artifacts that you see are actually from the book itself it's not from the scanner and it looks good and I also converted this with the OCR and let's see how good it is at capturing some of these texts on these documents let's do some searches we can start with the of course the part number of the document itself let's see if it finds that there it is it finds it right over here no issues it should also find it up here and indeed it does that without problems as well and there should be a few more mentions of it it also captures it as part of a larger board which is of course to be expected and a much smaller font over here it's still captured without issues and something on the next page there it is in the top right of the page it also has captured it mentioned in the body of the text no issues at all let's try something really tiny for example this trademark written over here let's zoom in here let's say this trademark does it pick that up trademark yep it does no problem and trademark and trademarks separately are distinguished yes it is let's try searching something inside of figures Now the PDF conversion has created some unusual artifacts in some of these values because it actually doesn't exist in the image that it scanned you can see the image itself is really quite clear but when it did a searchable PDF it did mess it up a little bit let's try searching something inside of this so for example will it find this part number inside of this figure so 2N3609 yep no problem it finds that without any issues uh, let's see it finds for example this number over here 6500 nope it didn't catch that it probably doesn't realize that this is text inside of this figure so it, it couldn't find that let's try something uh, close to the bottom here how about this word Epley yep it has no issue finding that so it does a reasonable good job but it sometimes misses something that is let's say a little bit unusual what about minus 50 here at the bottom left no it doesn't catch that so it, it couldn't figure out that the minus 50 is written here so yeah when there are a lot of images there it can get confused and you may have to run it more than once and play with some of the parameters to get the best out of it now when it comes to something like this so looking at this if I search for for example inner you can see that it finds the inner no problem here but if I search for circuits it doesn't realize that this whole big word is a word again you have you have to be really critical of finding something it cannot interpret it thinks that this is an image at the top of the unit there is a small LCD screen uh, that gives you some feedback on how you have placed your object under the camera this can be quite useful for when you have many many pages to do and you don't have a computer that you need to constantly look at so it's clearly designed for a lot of automated services so let's give it something really challenging, something that is not flat at all, of course, like this. And in books that you don't want to damage, you don't want to press down in the middle too hard. So now it has a curvature, and it's supposed to use a built-in laser system to figure out that curvature and correct for it in post-processing. Let's try this out. So here we're going to use the facing pages option over here. I have disabled the finger removal since I don't have my finger on the page itself, but you can see it's designed for many, many pages at a time, and you can remove the cut that comes with the unit directly from the image through automatic processing. I'm also going to merge these pages into one, so we get one big image that spans across the entire view here, and let's see what it does. Now, sometimes it does do something unusual in terms of processing, but generally it's okay, it's acceptable for many use cases. Let's see what it ends up with after this scan here so it's thinking about it how to flatten the page let's go back over here and see what it came up with there it is not too bad it, did, it couldn't of course remove this because it thinks that this is part of the page but overall it looks pretty good the middle of the page is almost gone there's a little bit of artifact left here and here but this is a really tough problem because this is very reflective and it's hard to remove that exactly from the page but overall I think it's a pretty good scan of this page and there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick look at the Caesar E24 vertical scanner. I think it's going to be a good unit here in the lab and hopefully you'll see it used more and more in future videos as we do tutorials or demonstrations that require some vertical recording and scanning. As always, I get no cut from the sales of any of these instruments and all the links that I provide are going to be direct links and you can of course make your own choices to see if it fits in your needs or not. And let me know what you think in the comment section. See you next time.